Welcome to Fontribute, where we talk about fonts and their attributes. Fontribute. It's me, Thomas, again, and I got another guest episode coming in now with another script, Hangul. Uh, we have Aaron Bell, the dialogue lead of Type Thursday Seattle, joining us. Aaron, thanks for joining me for this episode. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Thomas. Awesome. So as we, I, I gave you the slide decks to work with, and I see we got some Hang, we got some Korean uh, <laughs> on the front title. Yeah. So uh, what is this? Is this the like a translation of attribute? Yeah, transliteration. I think it's fontribute. Uh, oh, fun. <laughs> cool. All right. So let's let's jump in. So uh, what do we got? Like, what's the you know what are we what are we viewing here? Next slide. So the uh, the two fonts that we have uh, for the audience's viewing pleasure is one called Dohyeong and uh, one called Nanam Myeongjo. So uh, these are two fonts that are actually both on the, the Google uh, Web Fonts server. Uh, Dohyeon is a what's called a Dota or Gothic style font that's more meant for display. Um, when I say Dota or Gothic, I mean just that it has like squared off endings. It tends to have a bit more of this geoma geometric feel. Um, and then this Nena Myeongjo is what's called a Batang or a Myeongjo style font, which is more uh, indicate, uh, sorry, more meant for text. So this feature is sort of a flaring and outstrokes reminiscent of, of brush lettering and has this slightly more asymmetric uh, form. I mean by that is kind of like you get these shapes that are not quite square when you look at it. Yeah, versus the blocky nature, the one on the top I'm seeing. Exactly, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so, so those are the two fonts. Awesome. So I know the, I mean, clearly this is very different from uh, Latin system, right? In terms of the writing structure. Uh, I think your next slide goes over that, I believe. Yeah, I thought it might be useful to sort of talk through uh, a little bit about how Korean works for the general audience. So as we saw in the last slide, you know, a lot of, when you look at Korean, what you're actually looking at are these syllable blocks, which is to say uh, joins of component of, uh, uh, what are called jamo, which are consonants and vowel letter forms. So on this next slide, I have um, the set of basic consonants and basic vowels. There's some a little bit more complicated ones, but these are the basics. And then at the bottom, I have a list of the different ways that these consonants and vowels come together to create the syllables. So, you know, in this first set here, you kind of have the two, one on each side, um, or one above the other, or one in a corner and and the bit down sort of these two uh, vowels kind of wrap around the consonants. And then obviously in, in the other forms, you can also see just the way that those syllables and, and vowels work together. It's actually a pretty simple system. Um, you can learn to read and write it pretty quickly. Uh, now, of course, learning the understanding the language is a bit more complicated, but at least the the, the basics are all there. Yeah, is it? I mean, I'm getting the impression is this all? Is this a modular system? Like in the sense that your examples will have let's draw so you can see what I'm talking about, right? Notice they're all exactly the same square, and all the characters are fitting in it. Is this just a conceptual model, or are the things like the side bearings kind of missing mono uh, mono space almost like the same width for every unit? Like these are all the same uh, set width across the board. Yeah, so this is it. This is a, a square as you as you as you were describing. It's what's called the M square, which is basically just the the M of the, the M. Sorry, how do I put this? Um, it's the it's just a, a square in which the the East Asian characters tend to fit into. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be square. It can be more rectangular in either direction, depending on the circumstances, but. Um, the side bearings aren't always exactly the same. So for example, this guy with this long horizontal stroke will tend to have narrower side bearings than uh, this one with the shorter horizontal stroke. There'll be usually a little bit more space on either side of this character and this will be a little bit tighter. Uh, oops. Will be a little bit tighter to the edge of the M square. And it's not to say that, you know, they're going to be overall different in width, but uh, sorry, in terms of advanced width, but they will, you know, have a little bit of space differences between the side variants. Cool. And does uh, it seems 
is this the baseline right here? Is that the kind of example for all these? So this is the bottom of the M square. Um, if you think talking about the Latin baseline, that will usually end up being a little bit more like here. I see. Um, so on, on these characters, it sits maybe a little bit below where that big horizontal is. But it depends on the designer and their personal taste and how things should line up. Yeah. What's actually particularly interesting with the Korean is that because it's a center aligned script, um, you really want the middle of these to be in alignment, but the top and bottom doesn't matter quite as much. Hmm. Cool. Cool. Yeah, because I know from like the land tradition, right? Like basically, this sounds like a decenter space where you're right, re you're referencing over here, right? And markates this. This is here. This is similar to what you're referring. Not exactly there, but a little lower. Uh, Right, so, so basically something now all the characters have to occupy the entire M, M space, just like in, in land type face, they don't have to necessarily either. Yeah, exactly. Um, only it usually ends up being a bit more, yeah. So if you have this carry across, then you have you know, your, your, uh, your character there, or you know, this one kind of goes down, something like that. Yeah, exactly, like a little descender. But it's interesting, yeah, because yeah, normally we're taught, right, in, in, in the land tradition, right, we actually have a lot of things to balance. We have to balance, right, along the baseline, but also along the X height or the cap height position, generally. But you're saying, what you're saying is, generally, it's kind of this middle line alignment needs to happen. So all the other characters need to align to that green line I just demarcated in your example. Is that right? Yeah, so you'll end up with situations where like certain bits will be a little bit higher than other bits, certain ones will be a little bit lower than other bits, and that's totally fine. Now, the fun thing, of course, is when you're trying to pair the Latin with the Korean, is what? how do you do that alignment? Um, because, you know, when you have the X height, that's a certain height, but then the cap height is another height. And if you're trying to make this feel center aligned with, with Korean characters, well, that starts to become a little bit of a challenge. Nice. So usually the approach pe most people will use is to use the cap height and center that within the uh, the top and the bottom of the Korean character, and then let the the lowercase kind of sit a little bit too low. Now another approach that you could do is to say, well, in most cases caps are not used in Latin; it's mostly lowercase. So let's align the lowercase and let the cap sit a little high, or maybe you just make the cap height slightly shorter in order to it so that all of the Latin is a little bit more compacted around the middle. There's a lot of different ways you can try to solve mm -hmm. that problem depending on your personal taste and design style, but it's definitely a, a challenge. That's fun. I mean, quick question. Is that ever, I mean, this is all, you know, kind of like just punk, there's a uh, punctuation for capitals and punctuation for lowercase in Latin, right? Like maybe, yeah. You're, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the main things you do for capital sensitive punctuation is you do it literally a shift up, right? So say you have a mm -hmm. thing like this. Right, here's your X here. Right, and then you have a large uppercase letter. You shift up the punctuation, this case, or the the yeah, the punctuation elements. You shift them up to compensate for that. Right, the difference. Yeah. Of is that a similar? Is that is, is that one of the approaches that are thought of or considered? So that's actually something that I implemented in my typeface that I made at Reading, uh, where if the text is all lowercase, it would shift it up to be just sort of a little bit more centered and if it was an uppercase text it would actually um shift it down just a touch so yeah. that you know that kind of way to help sort of balance those on on an on the fly basis nice Very i'm cool. not sure if it's like you know the best solution but it's a, definitely an interesting one uh, um, but it's funny you mentioned punctuation because uh we're, we'll get the punctuation a bit later but in, in korean punctuation usually tends to need to sit a little bit lower than you would expect it for latin so what's really fun is when you is when you see text that's been set in Latin using a Korean font, you'll often see like you know you you have your letter A and then you have the, the the punctuation like sitting far beneath the baseline. You're like, why does it look like that? It's like, well, because it's not meant for Latin. Nice, excellent, cool. Um, that's actually that was very thorough and a lot of great information. So yeah, I think it's uh, I think we're ready to move on to the next segment. So. Alrighty. So, so what are you uh, seeing? So here are just a couple of samples of, and sentences of these two. Um, I think this this really helps you to see that difference of the square format versus sort of this more asymmetrical form. 
I think one of the things that is really particular about the square format is it's, it's looking to fill up the full of the M square. So when you look at say characters like this, like this one, you know, you can see it's it's intentionally, sorry, maybe I will do this way. This one versus yeah, like this that one. one. Yeah, they're the same um, one, right? Yeah, it's the same one. So you, but you can see that this particular Jamo is really quite tall, whereas this one is not quite as tall. And so they've intentionally made this one taller in order to really fill up the full square. Um, whereas here, there's more of an effort on the balance and the proportion of the the two Jamo of this this left consonant and the right vowel. Hmm. Is there? I mean. Would this almost be considered like kind of one of those like brutalist graphic design typefaces that are just raw geometry, right? Where they're kind of obliterating the calligraphic sourcing. Would that be fair an a fair analogy between these two? Yeah, I think it you could you could say that this Dohyon font is really like a graphical font. It's it's meant for large size display in a way that is just like really impactful and sort of in a graphical way. Whereas the Nanam Myongjo is much more uh, centric around um, like text setting and, and smaller type size and something that you can read and that's comfortable and easy, you know, versus one that is meant to grab your attention and kind of shake you around a bit. Cool. Yeah. Actually, yeah, and actually, really, I actually really see now once you demonstrated it that vertical, that kind of middle line alignment of the items. So it's, it seems to allow kind of bounciness on the top and bottoms, right? Exactly. Yes. Cool. Now, something else that's kind of interesting about Korean is that it, you know, in the old days, it was actually a, a vertical script for, for a long, long time. And so you can see a lot of that verticality still remain uh, when you look at uh, these Myeongjo or, or Batang style designs. So, for example, in this character key here, you kind of see it has a vertical axis just about there where like the, the balance of the left and the right are roughly even. Mm. Whereas, you know, and obviously in these these more uh, dotum style, they don't quite have that quite as much as strongly because it's more, everything is squared out. Um, now, obviously, you know, this horizontal axis is important, but then also this vertical one is as well. So when you're looking at like these nice text typefaces, you want to kind of look for both. Nice. Is it is it still practice to set these on vertically at all, or only horizontally now, like the typeset um, like going this way versus this way, or do they? I mean, I assume they go that way, or do they go this way and down? Oh no, no, it's it's all okay. uh, it's this way. Yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> just checking. Um, so sometimes text is set vertically. Um, there are actually typefaces that are designed to be set vertically. And when, it, when a typeface is designed to be set vertically, the vertical elements are actually enhanced more. So like these will get a bit longer and this will extend just a little bit down more like that. Mm. And so that really helps to emphasize that vertical axis even more so than something like, uh, like this design already has. Cool. So yeah, you can kind of do both. So you can do both, yeah. Ten, yeah. And but some typefaces are stronger or better built for that application than others. Yeah, and so like there's some that will come with an open type feature that say you know includes for vertical typesetting and it has basically an alternate version of all the glyphs that are a, a little bit more attuned for that scenario. Nice. So you you said that mainly references towards this you know more text favored kind. Is that ever is that ever the case for the display versions or the more larger graphic implications? Yeah, you could see this as well. Um, but I mean, you don't really have to do as much customization on something like this because it's so squared and graphical centric. So you, this actually would be very easy to stack one uh, syllable on top of the other. Mm. Great. OK, cool. Yeah. And then, you know, also I'm seeing the, you know, this seems I'm going to, is it fair to assume that like this is a word, this <clears throat> is a word? Is that the case? Or how is the yes. break up it happening here? Yeah, so Korean works actually very similar to English in that there's space between words and between grammatical elements. So yeah, each of these is a separate word. Or yeah, gr grammatical structure. Grammatical structure. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I I I think we'll talk about it later, but I'm curious about that decision, the spacing decisions, right? Between in the word space versus the internal spacing. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually what's, what's really interesting is you'll sometimes see that uh, Korean typefaces have far too much uh, space between uh, characters. Uh, and so many times people will actually uh, track everything in mm. in order to get like this really proper space. Like, you know, like here, for example, these elements, if they were at the same height, would almost touch or would actually barely touch, which is kind of ideal. But sometimes you see these characters that have just like really big uh, spacing around them. And that just doesn't really work for the way Koreans like to look at stuff. Huh. So they cool. track everything in, but then you get the English parts where everything is just like <laughs> slammed looking in, looking like that. Yeah, I see. and I'm always like, "Aha! I know what happened there." Well, that's fun. <laughs> is there? I mean, that sounds like a, is that a pretty common problem? Like this, basically too loosely spaced Korean. That's what it sounds like from their side bearings. I think it's more of an issue with um, older fonts, um, stuff that was you know, made probably back in the 90s. Um, most modern ones won't have that issue. Uh, but it's also, you know, the the taste of the typesetter, someone might be like, well, this I just I think it should be closer in. Mm. Cool. So yeah, yeah, most modern ones are gonna just look pretty good. Nice. Cool, cool. Oh, by the way, so like, I was playing the game of trying to because I'm, I'm not are these exactly the same words repeated in both of these yeah. examples? All right, cool. Now I'm going to play the game trying to match. So this is really interesting. Like, see this guy with this one, right? And then mm -hmm. this one. Yeah, this one with this one. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. I think uh, I think I saw this one is representing your slides, right? For the individual characters? Um, I don't think I have that specific one. I have this guy. Ah, uh, cool. Which has what? some similar <laughs> elements. Fascinating. I know. I would never know. I would never think that one. Would be <laughs> this one. Okay. Uh, I think you're. I. Or, what's the next slide? Actually, maybe it's appropriate to start moving on. Yeah. Well, let's start like just comparing some of the elements and kind of looking a bit more closely at, uh, you know, what makes a dotum versus the batang design. So, um, in the batang style, this this style, um, it's very much driven by a brush. Uh, the, the tool, which is the brush. And so you have this uh, flaring at the, the, on the in strokes. So you have a little bit of a tapering on the out stroke. Um, and then you kind of have this kind of treatment, you know, throughout where it's sort of uh, just a little weakening in the middle. Um, and that's just, you know, very common. If you've done brush calligraphy, this is sort of the way that you start drawing characters. And so in, in the dotum design, you know, you don't have any of that. It's sort of squared off everywhere this is about the same width as that so everything's about the same these are all the same widths um you know so that's sort of a key difference between these two but what's actually was really kind of cool about this is this little feature up there mm. and that little feature there so when a brush is is you know writing these characters you kind of sort of go in kind of go across um you don't just go straight down you kind of go across and then do this little turning stroke or folding stroke here, where the brush kind of comes up, down, a little bit like that. Uh, and it's mostly done in the hand more than the brush. But the process of doing this creates this little corner here. And they've shown that as well here by making it flat before starting the angle. And so it's even though this is a, you know, a sort of a dotum design a more graphical design they've still preserved that same uh you know brush inspired element in that that part of it which i thought was kind of cool nice yeah i also think it's interesting i'm seeing the length of these, of these strokes over here see this one protrudes out then this one notice mm -hmm. that versus these seem this one seems a little further out than this one uh yeah this, yeah yeah this one seems to give a feeling like it's moving this way i don't know right yeah so that's, I think that's just the, uh, you know, style of this particular designer who just chose to have this go a little bit longer and this one goes a little bit shorter. Um, I think this is a bit more sort of the classical style um, and this is a bit more of a graphical, but at the same time, these are sort of, it's not to say that these are fake characters because um, these are the Jamo by themselves. And so sometimes these can take on a slightly different form as individual, like isolated forms, than they would as part of the syllables. 
Nice. Cool. The other thing also is like, you know, this is really flat, whereas this is angled. Angled. So they could have done they could have done this one flat as well if they wanted to, but they chose to angle it. Hmm. What's the a qu question? Is there any is there any uh, reasoning for this inner space of the character? <laughs> um. Usually, you just want it to look balanced. Hmm. Like compared so to like, the, the whole stroke area. Yeah. So this is actually based on another character, which looks like that, and then you add this to change the sound slightly. And so, you know, you have this, this character has its sort of space in the middle and then you subdivide it. And so you create those spaces there. And I mean, you kind of want them to be not roughly balanced. You know, if you're, if you think about your white space, like so. Probably the one up here is a little less than this one. Right. But like, it's like, you know, when we're doing, um, when we're doing spacing between letters, you don't necessarily go, okay, well, there's the space of that. It's kind of a little bit more, a bit more like that. So oh, it's, it's still about even. Yeah. But anyway. Cool. I'll just say, a lot um, of this stuff is just kind of like, you know, playing with it and understanding and sort of learning to see, okay, that's about the right space for that. Yeah. I was just, re I was just reminded of the, of, uh, you know, capital H crossbar, right? We don't put it in the mathematical center, we put it in the optical center, which tends to be a little less here, a little more up here. And it's a little, yeah, the visual kind of how you figure that out, it's not like a mathematical formula, uh, but it's not the direct center because that would feel too low or feel too or feel not balanced. Yeah, for sure. And then also, you know, if you have, uh, you know, a character like this, that character, that middle stroke might be a little bit lower if you have one more like this, that stroke might be a little bit higher. So that its position will vary based on the syllable in which it's being used. Cool, awesome. Yeah, also, let's see. Da, da, da. Yeah, okay, that's good for now. So on the subject of things varying, um, here's like a couple of, this is the the siot, uh, sorry, siot uh, jamo, which is the, the S sound. And you can see it's really different between these two designs. So this one has this more of like a, a pyramid or an alpha kind of shape. And this one is taking on uh, a bit more of this, you know, these two diagonal sort of shapes. Mm. Um, one thing that's really useful to see here is this feature here. Yeah. Which I've now completely covered. <laughs> feature. Um, this is actually the entry stroke for the brush as it's proceeding through this in drawing this character. So it kind of goes like that, and then you finish it with this. And so this is actually a really common element that you'll see in a lot of vertical or near vertical strokes. So the, uh, let's say you have this guy, it'll have an entry stroke there, there, and actually even here. Hmm. So, you know, that character you were looking at earlier, we were like, man, I would not have predicted that this was the same you know, character as that. What's really the, the key different is that presence or lack thereof of that entry stroke in the corner that might start to be a bit confusing. Yeah. So then what, how can you, what's your account for like this? So like, how do we, how do we go from this to <clears throat> this? How does that happen? So the, the, the Siat's a really kind of cool to, uh, character and that it has a lot of different forms. Um, so, you know, obviously you have sort of this form, you can have a form that's a bit more like that. You can have a form that's more triangular. And obviously as you keep going up, it becomes more and more straight. I see. So is there, what's the other one? I think I've seen that. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually, like doing a design that kind of looks a bit more like this, which is a bit mad, maybe a <laughs> bit too far. Um, but like, it's it's the it's something of a, uh, it's a very constricted design language in that particular design. Yeah. Is there a specific uh, historical, temporal, like some kind of re reasoning that moves, like that moves this progression of abstraction over into this direction? Um, Not that I'm aware of. I think it's, I mean, I think there is, in some of the earliest Hangul, um, 
there is the shape that's kind of just like this. And then I think that's fairly easy to pull that out of. Um, I think, it, and actually, if anything, it probably moves more like this way. <laughs> mm. Nice. Because <laughs> um, like my my kind of personal theory is that the earliest stuff was was really meant to be drawn, you know, with sticks and the and the dirt, really easy, something very simple, nothing too complicated. And then as people started using the brush and trying to make it more beautiful, it started to take on a little bit more elegance. And so you end up with with that form at the end. You know, so you have the nice flaring, you have the tapering, little entry stroke, not this like squared off stuff that's going on over there. Nice. So really, in some ways, the the kind of essence of this character is this is really this triangular shape that this is just taking it to a more extreme uh, direction. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Um, and then also with with this see on oftentimes, um, you know, this is this character feels fairly balanced. But when you see it in uh, syllables, it'll often be a bit unbalanced, kind of like this. Mm. And the idea is that even though this character is now unbalanced as a whole, it's more the balanced. character feels balanced. Because right. it's sort of playing to that axis point that's going to the vertical axis point that we talked about. Nice. A yeah, quick question, actually. Do, does Hangul work in a sense of like a bunch of different, like, you see, let me put it this way, you know, in Latin, technically, or N, right, lowercase N, or H, right, and the M's, right, they're all the same formula structure, like they, all, they all carry from the same source, but we don't mm -hmm. just duplicate it, right, or not, especially, not, especially not the M, uh, we don't just duplicate N's, just redo it, we, we usually modify by making it narrower, for example, manually, yeah. Uh, yeah. is that a similar approach over here, or is it, I, that's what I'm going to assume, right, or is it some a different approach? It's uh, <laughs> it's complicated. Um, so because there's so much, uh, there's so many diversity of, there's so many different kinds of scenarios in which these um, uh, Jamo can appear, you often end up with a lot of different variants of it. So you might have one that's more you know, horizontal like this. You'll have a full width one. You'll have kind of a small one. You have the double sound one, and that comes with its own variants. Um, basically, anytime you have a different, okay, let me, let me put it this way. Let's say you have this sort of structure. So you have the siat up here, you have like an ah sound, and then you have the, the m, the mum down there. Now, if you swap this out with the ryu, which often requires more space, this has, this box has to adjust. So now if we put the ryu down there, this kind of moves up and this has to get more compressed. So you have like this variant where it's like, okay, everything's fine. And then you have this variant where, oh, no, suddenly this guy got to get a bit smaller in order to make room for that one. So you end up with having to have all these different variants of each character in order to achieve proper balance or proper proportionality between the, the, the different elements. The different elements in the character, yeah, and the the block, yeah. Exactly, so, you know, Glyphs has a nice feature of smart components, which allows you to sort of create these four extremes and then interpolate in between, but you still mm -hmm. have to figure out everything <laughs> and make these like lists of, okay, which one should go with what and sort of figure it out from there. Oh, well, that's cool. So, I mean that's actually really cool that uh, you're using interpolation. Basically, you're kind of building the extremas for all possibilities, <laughs> right? But then you still need to, you still gotta figure out which one applies applicably. Uh, right. And then usually do some customization to try and figure out like how much it should apply. Um, Cause for example, there's also the character that looks like this. And so having this little thing stick up there uh, you think to yourself, okay, well, if I have the C out, maybe instead of it coming down like this, it should actually, you know, come across a little bit more to make room for this bottom element that's sticking up a bit too much. Mm. So you have to, there's like customization that you have to do and you have to do a lot of other manual machinations to make sure that the por proportionality is correct and everything looks looks correct. Machinations, I like that word. That's a, yeah. <laughs> it sounds very appropriate. Okay. Jeez. Yeah. Okay, is, is it fair to say that like, that's less a concern here, or is that still happening here in this forms, but 
not as severely. So the this font actually will do it as well. They um, they I think are using a few fewer components than the Nanum design does. Um, so they have a I think just like they're repeating the forms more, um, but they do still have variants that change as as they go through design. I mean, actually, I have a slide about that a little bit later too. Oh, perfect, cool. So we'll talk about that when we get there. So moving on from this, I thought it'd be good just to go sort of do an overview of the different consonants and then also the vowels afterward. Um, since we've talked about some of these elements, like, you know, we look at, here's that entry stroke again, and then the lack thereof. Um, this one has that as well. Um, what's sort of fun is that these guys also carry the entry strokes there and there, and then they have the exit strokes sort of stick out the bottom. You have a bit of a gap in here, which is not present over on the other side. This is actually a, on this the, the jot here. You have this really interesting characteristic of these vertical slices on the design. Uh, usually, these would be more squared a little bit like that. Mm. Um, so you'd have a little bit more, you know, that kind of design. But you know, these the designers chose to do this very different sort of approach. Um, but one downside is that this character, this uh, geo character ends up playing a little bit unbalanced because this is a very heavy element up here and this is not quite strong enough to support it. Yeah. Whereas here, it's much lighter and there's a lot more strength down there to yeah, really- There's gaining weight over there, yeah. Exactly, to protect you know, sort of the structure of that character. Hmm. Another interesting thing is this little stroke here. Um, it can be vertical, as it's shown here, or it can be horizontal, or it can be at an angle. Hmm. It can uh, vary quite a bit, that one. Um, and so it sort of just depends on the design and the particular taste of the designer about which one they want to do. Yeah, it doesn't be consistent. It appears we have to be consistent, though, within its system. Yes. Yeah, they should be consistent. Um, but actually, on that character, the Hut, you can see this one has a lot more space in it. And they've chosen to merge all the all the strokes together over there. It's always a fun fun decision. Mm -hmm. And then here on the in hang, you have the entry stroke. You have the entry stroke present there, and you do not have it here. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I've actually seen this this can like be present or not depending on the design, even in a brush inspired one, because they people sometimes just leave it off. Mm -hmm. Is it when it's when it's in this style and removed? Is it just like a kind of an O shape, basically, with contrast added in? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Huh. Fascinating. Okay, cool. And then here in the viewer at the end, I, one thing I really like about this character is it really shows the stroke uh, order. So you have the one, two, and three. Obviously, that's a bit exaggerated. Whereas here, you kind of feel like, oh, it's just one stroke going around. Actually, mm. it's not. So that's yeah. why you have that element there. You have the entry stroke here, the turning, you know, and then this this just continues over. Anyway. Yeah. Nice. Random things I find interesting. <laughs> oh, I think it's very cool. Yeah, and as you hinted before, right? The the exit strokes, right? Basically over here, for example, right? Versus the mm -hmm. lack of it over there. Yeah. Precisely. Cool. All right. So what we got, and then yeah, so th those were the consonants. These are the vowels, or did I mix it up? Yeah, no, so these are the vowels. Yeah, those are the consonants. Yeah. And so you just see a lot of the same stuff here. Um, I think one thing that's kind of interesting is that there is a little bit of variation in height between these descending elements. So this is a little bit longer, that's a little bit shorter, whereas here they're both the same. And then similarly, uh, these are a little slightly off as well. They're not yeah. quite exactly the same uh, width. I'm oh, sorry, this, yeah, the same width. And so that's just helping to sort of further improve the balance and proportionality of those characters. That's cool. Yeah, I see that a little bit here. Like this is shorter than this length that's longer, right? Which is yeah. from this source. I do see that. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, cause it's it's balancing against this upper part of that, uh, the entry stroke there. Hmm. Kind of interesting. Cool. Yeah, is there any major, I mean, where you talk about the implications, some of the implications, like this, this makes is more suitable for vertical uh, usage, right? Because how much longer these work? And how, if so, they have any longer, if they were made for that? 
Well, I, I, I mentioned the thing a bit earlier that these are a little bit of a lie um, because they are uh, isolated forms. And so when it's an isolated form, they usually will make elements of the, make the characteristics a bit bigger and more uh, pronounced in order to sort of highlight the fact that it's this character in the isolated form. So this is much uh, bigger and longer. These are much longer than it would be in a syllable. Um, similarly, like this might be a bit, these would probably be a bit shorter. These would, you know, all be a bit shorter than they would be normally. Um, but they've just been extended here for the isolate form. Cool. Okay. So um, let's take a look at one of the syllables that we talked about earlier. So this is the ta sound. Um, now, what's kind of fun is, you know, we talked about this, this sort of M square where they want to fill up the whole thing. And that's clearly not the goal here on this side. You know, you have this big gap over here. You have this gap over here. And that's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like even the exit, like basically that exit, that a starting stroke, right? Over there. Yeah. The entry stroke there. Entry, yeah. Yeah. Versus the removal over there. Yeah. And the whole proportion is up too, right? This mm -hmm. is like a, like a tiny to that to that. Yeah. So there's actually a set of these like shapes, these sort of shadow shapes like this, um, where there's a, what's, the, what's the appropriate form? um for this kind of style and you know you have like this uh i forget the name of this kind of polygon but you know you see this quite uh, a lot in this sort of style another thing that's kind of interesting is that uh this part of the stroke just continues on and connects so usually this character you know you have that is the form and if you had a wow that's a really terrible version of that um if you had it in this structure it would simply end with the same kind of flared stroke um, the top has. But in this, in this uh, syllable structure, it will continue on and usually will connect up to um, the, the vowel. Yeah. <coughs> cool. Whereas, yeah, which you, you can which see is not happening there. Over there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. OK. Nice. And so this is, and this is fairly common, even if there's like a, another consonant down there, it'll just move, it'll get moved up. Nice. Cool. Yeah. All right. So I, I remember I talked to you earlier about some of the different shapes of the Jamo that they can take on. Mm. And so here you have the same uh, Kuke, uh character sort of in this side by side structure here in a top over bottom structure and then in a compressed bottom only structure. Yeah. <clears throat> Just marking it out for everybody to grab and see what we're talking about. Oh yeah. This guy. Whee. Mm -hmm. And so like in this in this one here, they have um, made this side of the Jamo vertical in order to sort of balance the top of this guy. And similarly you know, they've made those two vertical as well. Um, in this one, actually, maybe I'll just clear my drawings. In this one, um, these, this sort of outstroke has moved a little bit to the right in order to make room for that part of the vowel extending upward. Whereas over here, you don't have that vowel, so it's allowed to fully express itself down that way and really balance against this tall vertical. Nice. So in the Dohyeon font, they've done something similar, except this angle is about the same as that one. So this is not really as balanced as I would probably want to design it. Um, but it, you know, it's still totally readable and totally workable. Um, so they've just extended the, the length of this top stroke. Yeah, the compensate for that. Yeah, cool. Da -da -da. cool. Let's see. Oh yeah, and the other thing also is that um, you know here this height is fairly similar to that height, um, and they you know that helps it sort of this whole character feel fairly balanced. Whereas in this one, that's significantly larger than that guy, so this yeah. feels a bit top heavy as a as a character. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've gotten themselves into a little bit of a of a, a corner because of this stroke thickness. 
and really trying to preserve this stroke thickness and the spaces between these elements. And so there really just isn't much room for that bottom that bottom jamo to, to take in space. Yeah, I think your next slide really demonstrates that point. <clears throat> yeah, um, I thought it would be fun to show two of the most complicated characters that uh, exist in, in Hangul. Um, <laughs> I like doing these for, for testing. Mm. Oh, look at the lowercase g or s, right? And uh, they're both as weight possible in Len, kind of a similar model. Exactly. So one thing I thought particularly was interesting in this in this structure was that this real character here at the bottom is the same height across these two characters. Or as you notice over here, they are not the same height. So this top one, this this hyut, takes up more space than the sang hyuk does. Um, or I should say it usually requires more space than the sang hyuk does, but um, in Dong Hyun, they've done a uh, Do Hyun, They've done a little trick, and that they've basically uh, brought this top stroke a bit above the M the M square. So they've shifted it up a little bit. They've merged all of these strokes together to try and compress it into the same space. Mm. Now the advantage of that is it actually lets them sort of re sort of uh, copy this element as a component between these two syllables and so they only have to design one but what's strange is that these these are actually not the same component because the spacing is different and the width of this stroke is different yeah i see that so i thought that was interesting hmm. um but then over here on this side they because they've allowed the rear to become smaller so this space is smaller here than that space they've actually opened up a lot more room for this character versus the, this one. Yeah, and that's just pretty cool in, in this one, the kind of like triangularness, all right? This is kind of uh, feeling like the, you know this guy's taller than this one, and that's dropping down to this one. Uh, that seems like yep. a holographic principle I've seen in the land, in land calligraphy as well. And that's an, this is another one of those important shapes. Sort of this uh, polygon thing there. <laughs> yeah, trapezoid of some kind. Yeah, and also speaks to that uh, you know vertical axis. Because usually when when these things would be written, you'd have you kind of start here, kind of go down and then come up. So it's kind of like da, 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 something mm -hmm. like that. But cool. like this is just it's a very nice you know proportionality to have this slightly higher and that slightly higher. Yeah, nice. Cool. All right, let's do the next slide. Punctuation. So we talked, God. Yeah, we talked a little earlier about punctuation. Um, you know, you can see what's kind of interesting is that this one is right on there because it's really squared off. That guy's sitting a little bit below. I mean, punctuation is kind of not boring, but it's it's a bit more normal in Korean because they basically just use the same punctuation as English. Mm. Um, you know, the same quotes, same uh, exclamation point, question marks, commas, periods, you know, same thing. It's just slightly positioned a little bit off what we might expect otherwise. Yeah, because I'm, because I can't, I assume, wait, what, what, where would the Latin baseline be? Like, like here or something? Well, on this one, it's actually, it would probably be the same. Oh, cool. Okay. Because it's, it, this squared off structure is such that it would make sense to sort of make everything the same. On this one, I suspect they've probably made it follow these guidelines. I, I actually should probably take a look again. Um, so your H is probably going to be about like, like so. Okay. Now it's fun because when you compare it to this guy, it's actually going to extend a bit, you know, past that height. But that's you know, because you're trying to you're trying to get that center alignment, so it's all good. Yeah, so they basically raised it up, right, relative <clears> to the land. <throat> they put the land neck if it was in the same font. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, cool. Another fairly boring slide. Numbers. They use the same number system as as uh, Latin. So here's all the numbers. <laughs> nice. I don't have much to say on these, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it's all good. All right, so then we see the paragraph setting. Well, this is the display setting, I oh, think. Display setting, sorry, my, yeah, long That's day. the next slide. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I think one of the things that just jumps out at me in this sort of situation is that like the the, the Dohyeon is just a really visible, punchy design. Like you know, it it really grabs your attention with this this graphical element to it. This isn't to say that the Nyanam Yongjo doesn't grab your attention or isn't that, but it definitely feels a little bit like more meant for reading rather than for like short phrases and single words and things like that. Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, again, because everything seems to be aligned to that M square really tightly, this does feel very modular and very consistent across, while this mm -hmm. one has a lot more bounciness. Like I, I sense a lot more kinetic energy, right? A lot of yeah. flow in that. And so then that actually becomes more obvious when you look at it in smaller sizes, say in the, the paragraph setting, Here, um, cool. where uh, it's just, this is just has a lot of, of squareness going on. And this is just as a nicer, a bit of a nicer flow to it. Yeah. Now, something that I should probably point out is that this is actually not a normal text weight for Korean. Um, and actually, uh, Koreans will tend to use a, what has happened to me? Oh, my slides. Do, do, do. Go to next, go to next slide. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a little weird. You have to go like go all the way back and down yeah. to the bottom. I know. Our production quality. So, yeah, so right in, in, a, in text setting, you actually have, this is the, the proper weight. So it's even lighter than we might expect otherwise, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting challenge because then if you're creating a, a, a Korean complement for an existing Latin design, you actually might want to use like a semi-light Latin rather than the regular Latin because it, in the US and in other you know, European countries, we're used to reading heavier text. Nice. Do you think part of their explanation is the some of the complexity of the characters? A, a lighter weight means you can fit it, you can do it more su successfully than if the strokes were heavier. Yeah, I think that probably helps a lot. And I think it's, I mean, also I think there's probably just an element of what people got used to reading and this is sort of what they like, so. This is what what people do. Actually, yeah. So in my in my reading typeface, I actually created um, two different type families. One that was more Latin centric, and one that was more Korean centric. Uh, that were differentiated by their what their base weight was. Cool. Nice. Good to know that. Great. Yeah. So what's the conclusions you can take from all this? Ooh, what's the conclusion? I I just think that you know there is. I think one of the things I really love about Korean is that there is so much diversity in the style. I mean, this isn't to say that Latin doesn't have that kind of diversity, um, but like these really truly feel almost like different scripts in some ways. Um, and I really just love the, you know, how how this really punchy display character just like just comes out and is like like listen to me. And then, but then you can also have like this, you know, really beautiful, really text centric sort of like. I'm here. I'm here for reading. Just get you your information and uh, move along. Yeah. Do you have any other questions that jumps jumps to your mind? No, it's been very educational. I mean, I think the the really powerful thing was the explanation of a lot of the complexities in the uh, the book setting one, right? The these kind of exit strokes and entry strokes, right? Being not really essential, right? And then the the, the what what we would call the, like these air quotes sans serif Gothic edition. Kind of playing off that really extremely that at you know I, at points i was like how are they related i can't see how they're related but once you demonstrated to us how it made sense how they threw uh kind of abstraction it makes it still be it still makes sense they're actually the same character uh yeah very, totally very, very educational to me to hear that oh good yeah i'm glad i'm glad it was useful one one thing actually just jumps out to me here is that you know Dohyeon actually uh they get rid of spaces quite a lot so you end up with this this character that just sort of feels like it's a single piece when it's actually two pieces. Oh. I think that's just, you know, as a native speaker, you would just be like, oh yeah, I can read that. You know, it might be slightly irritating, but you're like, ah, it's fine, I can read it. Oh, kind of like the annoying ligature? Like one of those, yeah, really exactly. obnoxious, yeah, one of those obnoxious <laughs> ligatures. Like, I, re I know they're different, but they seem, they're, you're, you're gonna force them together. Yeah. Cool. Well, awesome. Well. Aaron, thanks so much for being on the call. I learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone else watching uh, has felt the same way. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much, everyone, for, for listening. Awesome. Well, everyone, please post if you love this, what you enjoyed out of it, uh, anything you'd like us to talk about again in another episode of, of Fontribute. And I know 
uh, Aaron, you, you had a slide before about different, uh, I think it was different weights or, 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 or other possibilities of exploring Hangul. I think it'd be great to explore those down the road. Yeah, totally. Awesome. All right, everyone, have a great week. Take care.